are listening to the PFAS Research and Remediation Podcast Series, produced and created by Arcadis, with funding from the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program, ESDCP, grant number ER23-7692, through the United States Department of Defense. All opinions, interpretations, and conclusions expressed belong to the hosts and guests and do not represent views or policies of the Department of Defense, Arcadis, or guest affiliations. In this first season, we're focused on PFAS and interview a broad panel of experts who have each contributed to the growing knowledge base around remediating this emerging chemical of concern. Today, I'm speaking with John Anderson, who's a principal wastewater engineer at Arcadis in Portland, Maine. While John started his career in in-situ treatment of chlorinated compounds and industrial wastewater treatment, he has spent the last several years specializing in methods for removal of residual PFAS from fire suppression systems during transition to PFAS-free firefighting formulations. Today, we'll be highlighting his project ER-217229, Aircraft Rescue and Firefighting Vehicle Cleaning Assessment which looks at PFAS left behind in a fire truck following removal of the PFAS-containing AFFF and water flushing. So I'm privileged to work with John on this project, and I know a little bit about the process, and I'm excited to talk to him about it today. I'm Dr. John C. Lang, a PFAS technical expert at Arcadis North America, and I'll be your host today. John and I were introduced at Arcadis right around the time we started working because there was a big push for this foam transition in the U.S. John, can you describe for listeners what I mean when I say foam transition? What is foam and what are we transitioning? Sure, John C. So in this case, foam is AFFF or aqueous foam forming foam, which contains PFAS. And so the PFAS in AFFF allows for the foam to put out class B flammable liquid fires. AFFF is really effective at that and has been historically used over the last 50 or 60 years for that purpose. As more awareness around PFAS has come to the forefront publicly, folks are looking to move away from those PFAS-containing foams and to other foams that don't contain PFAS to protect both firefighting personnel and the environment. So foam transition is the process of replacing that AFFF with a non-fluorinated foam. And What has been found in the industry over the years is that doing something like taking the AFFF out and either immediately replacing it with non-fluorinated foam or taking the AFFF out, doing a series of water rinses and then putting in non-fluorinated foam is not necessarily sufficient to get your PFAS levels in the system down to a level that would not cause future liability, whether it be by release into the environment or waste of the foam. So essentially you're saying there's buildup on the wetted surface of infrastructure that's been in contact with foam over time. Yeah, that's right. And a metaphor that you've used in the past that I think is really great is bacon grease in a pan. And if you make bacon in a pan and then you go to try to wash that pan with water, you'll find that you still end up with this sort of greasy residue underneath the water rinse in the pan. And it requires, in this case of bacon grease, some sort of like a Dawn soap or something like that to actually break through those layers of the grease in the pan. This is very similar. The water will get sort of the the easy bits of the layers in the systems of PFAS out, but what it isn't able to do is truly disrupt those layers in a way that will get the majority of the PFAS out that would reduce that liability. What is the danger of improperly transitioning your foam concentrate system? You say you do a bad job of it and there is residual left behind, why does that matter? That matters because uh, when you put in your new foam, presumably non-fluorinated, if the transition process is not successfully removed the most PFAS that it can, you end up with a significant PFAS concentration in that new foam. So you have a foam that was presumably non-fluorinated, you put it into your truck, it sits in the truck for a while, And because the foam transition was not completely successful, you end up with back diffusion of PFAS into that foam so that if you use that foam, it is now a PFAS impacted foam. So for this project specifically, you're looking at fire trucks and air rescue firefighting vehicles. Is that correct? That's correct. So the air rescue firefighting apparatuses or ARF apparatuses are the ones that you see at the airport. And we were doing that at a Department of Defense facility. We actually went to the site and helped take apart all the wetted surfaces inside that truck that have to do with foam delivery. So we're talking about the concentrate system 
which is where the foam concentrate sits in a tank and then is delivered through piping to the proportioner. We're talking about the water system, which is where the water sits in a tank in the truck and then is delivered to the proportioner. And then we're also talking about the mixed foam system, which is where the water and the foam combine at the proportioner to then put out a much reduced concentration of a foam that's then applied to the fire. So you have this fire truck at a DOD facility, and what was done prior to removal of these parts to the truck? That's a good question. So generally on the project, what we were trying to do is determine whether or not a series of water rinses, in this case three, was enough to remove PFAS off of the parts. And then B, the other part was to actually take all the parts out and then replace those parts with brand new parts. And the idea there being, can the Department of Defense as a standard procedure, remove all the parts from a truck, put in new parts to remove the PFAS from inside the truck. And so when we went out, we did a three times water rinse on the truck, and then all the parts came out. To date, we've not been able to put the truck back together to do a confirmatory set of three water rinses because supply chain issues and some inventory issues that we had initially did not allow all the parts to be there when we took it apart. So that truck that we took apart in second quarter of 2020. Two is still sitting disassembled at the facility. Oh, interesting. So as far as going forward, is it reasonable to think that you could, for all the DOD fire trucks or or for all our apparatuses, do a system replace? Sounds like you had trouble getting parts. Is this something that you could foresee as being an issue if you went down the replace route for these trucks as opposed to cleaning? Certainly, based on our experience on this project, there would be a lot of preliminary hurdles that would have to be cleared to make that viable. Most of the parts inside these trucks are really custom manufactured parts. They're not your typical elbows or straight pipe pieces. And so if they need to be replaced, it may take some time to get those parts actually reconstructed. And the other thing that we have seen on this truck, that this was true, is that the parts that were missing for the reconstruction were parts that were sort of custom put together after the truck was delivered. And so all of these trucks are going to have varying maintenance histories and varying histories where they may have sort of field replaced parts, which are not, you know, the manufacturer supplied parts. So you water flushed the truck, you took all the parts out, you shipped them to your treatability lab, and now you're extracting them individually to look at PFAS content that's essentially their post water flushing, what's left if you only do a three step water flush. You were looking at both the foam concentrate system as well as the water only side. Are you seeing impacts on the water only side? We are, yeah. Our initial water rinse data that we took when we did the three step water rinse before we took the system apart, we did see PFAS. In all three of the system, we, we rinsed them separately. So we, we rinsed the water system separately from the foam system and then the mix system separately from the other two as well so that we could actually isolate where we were seeing PFAS. And we did see PFAS in all three systems. And so you have this ARF and you went to a DOD facility and you removed all of these parts. How many parts are we talking? We removed all the parts and then we shipped them to our treatability lab for characterization. But we were talking about somewhere between 100 and 120 individual parts or connected parts together. It was about 120. So what would you say is the most difficult part you have as far as shipping and removal? Are some of these parts big or is this all relatively easy to remove and ship? By far, the most difficult part to handle was the water pump that is part of the apparatus. I don't know the exact weight, but I was told it was somewhere around 800 pounds And so it's actually currently sitting in the treatability lab on a pallet. And how we're actually going to manage the characterization of that is something we're still sorting out, though I do know the other day the the lab personnel were excited to actually take that thing apart. So I think we have it in pieces now. But most of the other parts were, you know, piping or valves or hoses that were inside that, that vehicle. Some of them were significantly easier to characterize than others. Our more established characterization technique is a destructive technique where we actually use a bandsaw to cut up the pipes and then put them into a jar and put a solvent in there to extract the PFAS off and then analyze that. A lot of them we were able to do that way. Some of them we actually had to do what we called our a cap and fill method, which was to fill the part with the solvent and then send out the solvent from inside. And then we're also going to be doing some 
sort of wipe sampling that we use to swab a specific area and then and analyze that for PFAS content. We're still in the process of getting a lot of our extraction data back, but our initial findings are that we are seeing PFAS loading even after water rinse in all three sides, if you will, all three of the, the systems that are on board. So if you were to think about replacement versus cleaning, you're going to have to replace not only the foam concentrate side, but also the water only components of the truck. That's what it's looking like. And one of the other pieces of this project and the reason that we're doing the individual part characterization is that we want to be able to try to show at the end of this, if there are any sort of bad actor parts, if you will, parts that have significantly higher PFAS concentrations on them than others, so that you could identify whether or not you could replace 15 of the 120 parts and get a large, a large enough removal of PFAS that you don't have to replace the whole system. But that's something that is yet to be seen. So individual parts having different concentrations, could that be material dependent? Are there different material types for these parts or are they all pretty much stainless steel? That's a good question. So when we did this inventory, when we took apart the truck, we were very careful to make sure we understood what system each part was a part of, the water, foam, or mix system. And we also have been tracking things like the geometry of the part. So if you think about like an elbow versus a straight on a pipe, We've also been tracking the material of construction. And to answer your question, we've seen materials, we've seen stainless steel, we've seen brass, we've seen various forms of plastic, and we've seen essentially rubber hoses. And so we're keeping track of that information as well so we can determine whether or not there's a variation of PFAS loading based on the material construction. So John, I think this is your first ESTCP project where you're a PI on it getting into this new world and grant funding and things like that, can you talk a little bit about moving from more of a client-based consulting world into this kind of research grant funding world and how that's been a unique transition for you? Yeah, sure. This is the the first project that I've had with Sertip or ESTCP where I'm the principal investigator. And it's been a really rewarding experience for me. I, As you mentioned, I spent a lot of time sort of working in a more private sector with industrial wastewater treatment and with this foam transition work. And so one of the things that I love about this is that it gives me the opportunity to really dig into the science behind what I do as an engineer. Because my undergraduate degree was not in engineering, I, I would say I have a well-rounded idea of the science and the engineering and how they go hand in hand. And so I like to be able to dig into the science here with ESTCP and understand it further and be able to speak to some of the things that we're seeing as we apply these methods in the field. What would you say has been the most difficult part about being a PI on an ESTCP grant? I would say probably the most difficult thing for me has been leading a team of folks to do work that while I may not necessarily know exactly how to do it, I know they do. So one of the primary functions of this work, this project is really focusing on the in-lab characterization work and sort of the analytical methods that go into understanding the PFAS content on these materials. And while I understand a lot about PFAS treatment and I understand a lot about foam transition, I am not an analytical scientist. And so it's been very exciting for me to learn from these experts in their field about how these methods work and how we can apply them to these different materials and then how we can take that information and apply it to a more engineering type space, understanding the cleaning or the replacement of these these materials. So outside of taking these parts and extracting them in methanol and having that methanol analyzed for PFAS content, are you doing any sort of methods that look at the pipe directly as opposed to using extraction methods? Yeah. So we are doing the, the liquid extraction characterization of PFAS, and that gives us a little bit of an indirect look into how much PFAS is on the surfaces because we're actually analyzing the extractant and not the surfaces themselves. But as another line of evidence, we're also looking at some surface analytical methods. We're looking at scan electron microscopy to get images of the part surfaces. We're looking at X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy as a way to measure the percent of element of each element on the surface. And so that'll show you some of the metal elements as well as the fluorine element as an approximation of PFAS on the surface. And we're also looking at particle-induced gamma ray emission spectroscopy, which is a method that is that looks at the surface and also quantifies the amount of fluorine on the surface. And that's a technique that we're really digging into because of the depth of analysis on the surface. And we want to be able to look into how that piggy analysis can really look at the PFAS on these surfaces. 
What do you consider the largest challenge to foam transition right now? So say we today decide we're going to try to get PFAS out of all of our fire suppression systems throughout the country. What's stopping us from doing that tomorrow? There are a couple things to answer that question, actually. One is that when most of these fire suppression systems were installed, they were installed in a way that nobody considered how you would clean them because at the time there was no reason to clean them. They contained foam and the foam was directed in that system to suppress fires and that's exactly what they were designed for. And so because they were not designed to clean them, if and when a system needs to be cleaned, that means that the fire suppression is no longer active. And so the facility that it is protecting either needs alternative to its existing fire suppression or it needs to be shut down such that there's not that risk of fire in that facility. And so because of that complication, these fire suppression systems are protecting oftentimes large areas of production facilities or active hangars that it is not only costly, but in some ways almost infeasible to turn them off in a way that they cannot remain protected. So actually downtime of the systems you think is one of the major hurdles to get over. It certainly can be. And in some cases, there just aren't obvious ways to either maintain that fire suppression protection or to be able to to shut down either the production or distribution facility or hangar in a way that is viable commercially. So what has come out of your research that you think is important for other researchers to know? I think by taking apart this vehicle and looking at a broad range of part geometry of materials of construction. I think what we're learning out of this is that A, PFAS is not selective to any of these individual geometries, materials of construction or system in that is appeared to be in every single part that we have seen. But also B, we're starting to see that the material of construction can matter when it comes to the magnitude of PFAS on that surface. You removed over a hundred parts from this fire truck. Are there any parts where you're able to do replicate measurements? So is anything big enough that you can look at the variability of PFAS across a single part? That's a great question. There are some parts that based on their geometry, we've had to basically only have a single replicate. There are sections of piping that are large enough that we can then do multiple replicates of the destructive extraction, and then we can get some sort of statistical power on that. And also we have some parts that have multiple geometries in the same part where we've actually taken them apart and split them into individual samples so that we could sort of speak to the relative PFAS value in an elbow or a straight in the same location. I'd just like to close this conversation today by thanking John for joining me to talk about his project. I can't wait to see the full results come out in the future. Thank you so much for listening. This podcast was funded by ESTCP and produced by Arcadis. The interview was conducted by Dr. John C. Lang, and our guest today was Mr. John Anderson. If you're interested in more information on John's project, please see the ESTCP website for the project number ER217229. If you have conducted your own research on BFAST and are interested in sharing your work, please email Teresa Gillette at Teresa.Gillette at Arcadis.com. That's T H E R E S A dot G U I L L E T T E at A R C A D I S.com. And please keep an eye out for more episodes coming soon. Mm-hmm.